Welcome to Philosophical Conversations, I'm Sarah Jane Leslie. Consider the task faced by the members of a jury in a criminal trial. They must listen carefully to the evidence presented and from it piece together an understanding of the events in question. They must come to understand the causal sequence of events, which incident led to which consequence. They must also strive to understand the mental state of the accused. What was the defendant's state of mind? And often, did he or she act intentionally? That is, did he or she mean for things to unfold as they did? After all, the difference between the crime of voluntary manslaughter and the crime of involuntary manslaughter consists in little more than the question of whether the perpetrator intended to cause the victim's death. It is only, we might suppose, after they have formed a view of how the unfortunate sequence of events unfolded and of what the defendant's mindset and intentions were that the jury can even be in a position to consider the question of whether wrongdoing occurred. That is to say, we expect a jury to first form a view of the facts of the case and only then decide the defendant's guilt. We would perhaps consider it a travesty of justice if a member of a jury began with a legal evaluation and then formed a view of the facts of the case in light of that judgment. We might naturally think that the neutral descriptive facts should be understood first and that evaluations both legal and moral are appropriate only once this prior understanding is firmly in place. One should, for example, first determine whether a person acted intentionally as she did and only then decide whether what she did was wrong. A growing body of evidence suggests, however, that we do not in general follow such a linear path from descriptive facts to evaluative judgments, but rather that the two are intricately intertwined with each informing the other. We do not first form a neutral view of the facts of the case, as it were, and only then evaluate it morally, but rather our very perception of what happened is itself informed by our moral viewpoint. Joining us today is Dr. Joshua Nob, Professor of Cognitive Science and Philosophy at Yale University. Professor Nob has authored more than 60 articles in philosophy and psychology and has edited two volumes. His work has received considerable media attention, including from outlets such as the New York Times, the BBC, Scientific American, and Slate magazine. Along with his collaborators, he has produced an extremely impressive body of evidence that reflects how our seemingly neutral perceptions of the world are often unbeknownst to us, informed by our moral evaluations. So maybe we could begin with you giving us an example of how our attributions of intentional action are affected by our evaluative judgments. Sure. So let's consider a case that comes in two different versions. So we'll start with the first version. So imagine the vice president of a company goes to the chairman of the board and he says, OK, we've got this new policy. It's going to make huge amounts of money for the company, but it's also going to harm the environment. And the chairman of the board thinks about it for a moment and he just says, look, I know this policy is going to harm the environment, but I don't care at all about that. All I care about is just making as much money as we possibly can. So let's implement the policy. So then they implement the policy, and sure enough, it ends up harming the environment. And the question that participants are asked is just, did the chairman of the board harm the environment intentionally? I would say yes. So when pe if you, most people say yes, and if you ask them, you know, why did you say that? People have a pretty simple idea. They think, well, he knew that it was going to harm the environment and just went ahead and did it anyway. So it's this fact that he knew that he had this mental state that makes it intentional. But we thought maybe something more subtle was going on. Maybe it wasn't just the fact that he knew, it's the fact that you see harm the environment as something bad. So let's suppose we take a case that's almost exactly the same, but we just change the word harm to help. So now the vice president goes to the chairman of the board and he says, OK, we've got this new policy. It's going to make huge amounts of money for our company. And it's also going to help the environment. 
And the chairman of the board thinks about it for a moment and he says, look, I know this policy is going to help the environment, but I don't care at all about that. All I care about is just making as much money as possible. So let's implement the policy. So they implement the policy and then sure enough, it ends up helping the environment. So did he help the environment intentionally? Here it's hard to say yes. But it seems like the only thing that's changing between the one case and the other is just whether he did something bad, harming the environment, or something good, helping the environment. So this judgment that you'd think has nothing to do with anything moral, it's just a judgment, did he do it intentionally, is actually being affected by our moral judgments, by our judgments about whether he's doing something good or bad. Huh. So whether we attribute this intention or not to the chairperson depends on whether the outcome of his action was something that we would evaluate as morally positive or morally negative. Right, and I mean, of course, we know that there are many things that depend on moral judgment. Whether he should be punished depends on that, whether he should be blamed depends on that. But you'd think that whether he did it intentionally, it's just a judgment about what was going on in his mind. Not in any way a judgment about whether he did something good or bad. And yet, even here, in what seems like just a purely factual kind of question, we're seeing this infusion of people's moral values. I, the effects of moral judgment limited to our attributions of intentional action? Not at all. It seems like this is just one symptom of a much more pervasive phenomenon. So in the case that I just described, if you ask, did he decide to harm the environment and did he decide to help the environment? People say yes for, for harm, no for help. If you say, was he in favor of helping the environment? People say um, he was in favor of harming but not in favor of helping. And if you consider other cases that don't have anything to do with people's psychological states in the way that intending or deciding or being in favor or do, you see all these same kind of phenomena arising, even outside the domain of psychology. So what would be an example of that? Well, consider, for example, our judgments about whether or not something is innate. So we think that certain traits that we have are innate and others are in some way acquired from the environment. If you ask people, you know, how you make those judgments, people think it maybe it has something to do with statistics or something about the mechanism, something purely scientific. But we thought even in that kind of case, you could see people's moral judgments actually playing a role. So consider again two different cases. So one, imagine there's this trait, it's called trait X. And now people, scientists have discovered this funny fact about trait X. It turns out that people's genes are such that as long as their parents treat them decently sometimes, they're going to develop trait X. But everyone's parents treat them decently at least sometimes. So everyone develops trait X. Okay, here's the question. Is trait X innate? So the manifestation of this trait is caused by, on the one hand, a genetic component, but also it has an environmental prerequisite. And further, everyone has the genetic component, and everyone also experiences the environmental trigger. Mm -hmm. And so what do people say in that case? The vast majority of people say it's innate. And in fact, if you ask scientists, if you talk to, if when we did the study on biologists, on linguists, mm -hmm. on psychologists, they also tend to say that it's innate. And for exactly the reasons that you suggested, they say, well, you can tell that it's innate because it involves this genetic factor, also an environmental factor, but an environmental factor that's always present, mm -hmm. present invariantly. That's just kind of the background condition that allows the genetic factor to sort of manifest itself. And so that would be one scenario, but is there a contrast case? Yeah, so imagine a, a case that's almost exactly the same, except for, again, we're just going to change one word. So imagine there's this trait, it's called trait X, and people's genes are such that they'll develop trait X as long as their parents treat them badly sometimes. But everyone's parents treat them badly at least sometimes, so everyone develops trait X. Now, is trait X innate? Hmm. So what would you say, what's your intuition in that case? I think I can definitely feel the pull there towards saying that trait X is not innate. It doesn't oh. seem so clearly innate as in the other case, even though we've specified that everyone's parents treat them at sometimes decently, but in other times harshly. Even though these background conditions are the same, it does seem that there's a pool towards giving a different kind of answer to that case. I, is that what people do? Exactly. In the first case, people kind of feel like it's your genes that are giving you the trait, and then the nice treatment from your parents is just this background condition that makes it possible for the genes to have their effect. In the case in which the parents are treating you badly, it's the reverse. People feel like your genes are just such that your parents treating you badly kind of causes this trait to appear. And it's really your environment, the b bad treatment on the part of the parents that's causing the trait to appear. So here we've just talked about two different examples, mm -hmm. doing things intentionally, being in need. But these examples are just two examples out of a whole plethora. As people continue working on this, they find more and more cases in which a, a, a question that seems to be a purely factual question can actually be influenced by people's moral values. 
What about our understanding of what we might think of as more physical events? For example, what event caused which other event? Would you see that same influence there, or is that something that's maybe screened off from these kinds of effects? Even in the case of just judgments about whether one thing caused another, you see that exact same effect happening. So, for example, suppose we talk, tell people about a philosophy department where the, the receptionist's desk has a whole set of pens on it. And now the receptionist tells people, administrative assistants are allowed to take the pens, but faculty members are not supposed to take the pens. They're supposed to get their own. Faculty members just keep taking the pens though, so the, the receptionist just keeps sending them these like ever more insistent emails, guys, stop it, don't take these pens, they're only for the administrative assistants. So now imagine that one day, Professor Smith and the administrative assistant both walk past the desk and they each take a pen. And now, there's a problem. There's no pens left on the desk. So who caused the problem? Was it the administrative assistant? Was it Professor Smith? In a case like that, people say the administrative assistant didn't cause the problem, but Professor Smith did cause the problem, even though both of them did exactly the same thing and seemed to stand in exactly the same kind of relationship to the event that occurred. Now, as you're describing these cases, one thought that comes to my mind is, Look, when a problem arises, say the administrative assistant being unable to, to take a message, or uh, more dramatically, if the environment is being harmed by some kind of action, well, look, we just really want to blame someone mm -hmm. for this. We really want to say, here's the culprit, here's the wrongdoer, here's the person that deserves to be blamed and chastised. Do you think that that's um, just what's underlying these judgments, that we are maybe motivated to find someone to blame, and as a result, we do everything we can to attribute, say, intentional action or, or attribute being the cause of the problem to um, the individual who is perhaps the most salient recipient of that kind of blame? You know, that's a really great hypothesis, and some people think that maybe it's the right one, that that's on the right track. But there's been a whole bunch of experiments designed to test that hypothesis, and my sense is that overall they're pointing to the view, no, that it's not due to that. So a really nice example is an experiment that was done by the great psychologist Lian Yang. She was interested in this exact idea and she thought maybe one way to test it is to look at people who show a kind of deficit in this kind of emotional mm -hmm. response. So you and I, if we heard this kind of story about someone who callously hurts the, uh, the environment, we might just get kind of upset about it. But what if we look at other people who don't feel that way? Are they going to still show the same kind of effect? So Young turned to um, participants who had damaged the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So this is this brain region that is really involved in sort of integrating emotion into people's decision making. So people who have damaged this brain region, if you ask them some question in which you and I would show an effect of emotion, often they won't. But they still showed exactly the same response that you and I would show in these cases. In fact, 100% of these patients said that he harmed the environment intentionally. So as just one example among many, that just seems to provide at least some evidence that what's going on in this case among normal participants isn't that their view is just being clouded by emotion, because those people who don't show this kind of effect in other kinds of cases still do show this effect. But now, maybe being mad and therefore wanting to blame something is one thing, and so I can see how that experiment would tell against that hypothesis, but is it clear that people who have damage to this brain region wouldn't nonetheless want to maybe blame someone, even if they're not having an effective response. Do you know, that's a great response, and in fact, that's the exact response the defenders of this kind of blame hypothesis gave to Young's original study and to other studies along that line. So for example, Abigail Marsh ran a study in which she looked at psychopaths and their judgments about these cases. Psychopaths, again, show the same effect as normals, mm -hmm. but defenders of this blame hypothesis could say, you know, psychopaths don't have the same emotional reaction, they still want to blame people. But let's consider a very different kind of case. So let's consider uh, what would happen if we looked at people's causal judgments about an outcome that's good. So f suppose we just change the case I gave you earlier about um, Professor Smith and administrative assistant each taking a pen, so the outcome turned out to be something good. For example, suppose that the receptionist had always wanted to kill the chairman of the department. So what she was going to do is just take the, one of these pens and stab her eye out so with, the, with the pen. So there's the chair, she's just sitting innocently in her office. The receptionist is thinking of like wielding this pen and stabbing her eye out. Now, Professor Smith and the administrative assistant each walk by. The administrative assistant is allowed to take pens. Professor Smith's not allowed to. They both take a pen, and then this wonderful thing happens. The chair's life is saved. So who saved her life? Was it the administrative assistant doing exactly what she was supposed to do? Or was it 
the professor who's doing what she's not supposed to do, stealing one of these pens. And in a case like that, where the outcome is good, people still say it's the one who did something bad that caused it. But here, that kind of explanation in terms of justifying blame no longer seems to make sense. So suppose that you really hated Professor Smith. You were just trying to think of something terrible to say about her, some way to justify blame for her. You couldn't possibly do that by saying, I hate her so much, I just want to say that she is the cause of this wonderful outcome that arose. Right, right. Wow, so people still give that same pattern of response, attributing the cause of the outcome to Professor Smith's actions, mm -hmm. even when you wouldn't want to blame Professor Smith for right, it. Right, exactly. So there seems to be a general tendency to think of bad things as more causal across the board. Bad things are seen more as the cause of bad things, more as the cause of neutral things, and even more as the cause of perfectly good things. I'm just in, interested thinking in terms of a real-world example of this. Sometimes if, for example, one's discussing whether having both parents work outside of the home has negative effects on the child, and um, I'm not sure that this is at all supported by the evidence, but let's just suppose that we find evidence that actually this was detrimental to the child. Very often, particularly maybe in more conservative circles, you hear discussion of how the mother working outside of the home mm -hmm. caused the child to, say, have behavioral problems or fare less well in mm -hmm. school. And you very rarely hear discussion of the fathers working outside of the home mm -hmm. being the cause of the child's um, difficulties. Do you think that that fits the same framework? Right, exactly. So when you first hear that, that fact, you might think, well, these conservatives are just failing to see that what, the, what, a, what is really a factual question for what it is. They're allowing their values to kind of intrude. But I think the opposite is the case. You might think that the conservatives' values are just mistaken, and for that reason you think they're wrong in this causal judgment. But you shouldn't think that this question that they're asking is fundamentally not a purely factual question, and it's just this weird yeah. fact about them that their values intrude. Rather, both conservatives and liberals are allowing their values to intrude in these kinds of cases. It's just that they have opposite values. And so in this kind of case, probably, you reach the opposite judgment from the one that they would. So we might criticize the values here, the value that um, it's the woman's duty and not the man's duty to be the person who, say, sacrifices career for children. We might attack that particular stance, but we wouldn't want to criticize people just on the grounds that they let some or other value influence these sorts of right. judgments. I think that the question fundamentally is a question of value. The thing that conservatives maybe are getting wrong in this case mm -hmm. is just they're wrong about the right role that women mm -hmm. should have. There's actually a really interesting experiment by Pete Ditto and colleagues on this topic, and they just decided to look at people's judgments about the Iraq War. So in one condition, participants were told, Sometimes American soldiers want to bomb the um, Iraqi insurgents, but they know that there are other innocent Iraqis who are just around, and those innocent Iraqis are going to be killed as well. They're not trying to kill them, but they're aware that's going to happen. So did the Americans kill the innocent Iraqis intentionally? By contrast, in the other case, people just get the reverse story. The Iraqi insurgents are trying to bomb the American soldiers, but they realize there are other innocent Americans who are just going to round. They're not trying to kill those Americans. They just know they're going to be killed if they kill the soldiers. So did the Iraqis kill the other Americans intentionally? So then this experiment has been tried on liberals and on conservatives. Mm -hmm. So what conservatives tend to say is this. The Americans killed the innocent Iraqis unintentionally, but the Iraqis killed the innocent Americans intentionally. By contrast, the liberals show the reverse kind of judgment. They tend to say the Americans killed the innocent Iraqis intentionally, but the Iraqis killed the innocent Americans unintentionally. Wow. Huh. So that would again have to do with the background evaluative judgment that these two groups are making, presumably having to do with whether they think, say, the war in Iraq is justified, mm -hmm. um, whether it's something that ought to have taken place. Right, so it seems like our judgments about whether someone brought about these kinds of effects intentionally aren't sort of prior to our value judgments. They're, as it were, downstream from our value judgments. They're coming after our judgments about whether the war itself is actually a justified war. Now. I'm just wondering how much this may have to do with the language that we're using, particularly this idiom of act intentionally. I'm thinking that there's a phenomenon that's often known as pragmatics, whereby uh, we may uh, assert or communicate rather more than our words literally mean. So as one illustration of this, suppose that it's incredibly hot outside, suppose it's 100 degrees out there, and someone asks, what's the weather like today? And suppose I say, it's warm. Now, 
That may be perhaps literally true. If something is hot, if a day is hot, then it's also going to be a day that's warm. You can't be hot without also being warm, as it were. But there's something misleading about what I said. And philosophers of language often talk about this as a pragmatic implicature. Uh, even if my words uh, didn't semantically mean that it couldn't also be hot, in a conversational context, it would be inappropriate uh, to describe such a hot day as just simply being a warm day. So I wonder if, I, if an alternative account could be formulated along these lines, perhaps when we say the CEO acted intentionally to harm the environment, we're maybe not literally, semantically speaking, attributing this intention to him, but we're, as it were, flagging him in the conversational context as being an object of blame there. So this wouldn't be a matter of us being motivated to attribute blame, but rather wanting in the conversational context to communicate that this is the person to be blamed. You know, that's also a really great hypothesis, and also one that a number of people think actually might be on the right track. But again, it's one that I think the evidence is pointing against. So one really recent study that seems to point against it was something by the cognitive psychologist Tiziana Zala. What she did was to try this exact same study that we've been talking about, but on a population that really has an impairment in understanding these issues, an impairment in understanding conversational pragmatics. So in particular, she looked at people with a high functioning form of autism, namely with Asperger's disorder. So these are people where if you give them ordinary kind of cases that involve conversational pragmatics, Instead of answering in the way that you or I would, the answer just completely, literally, they'll just correctly answer the question. So literally, it's true, so I'm just gonna say yes. Mm -hmm. And then she just gave them again these cases of the person who harms or helps the environment. But strikingly, they show exactly the same answers to that kind of question that ordinary folks do. So they're impaired in the capacity for a pragmatic uh, implicature. They show exactly the same response on this particular question. So, an inference you might make is maybe our, the ordinary response people give on that case isn't due to our ability to understand pragmatic implicatures. Mm -hmm. Now young children, preschoolers, uh, are often similarly unable to understand pragmatic inference. They don't show the, the same understanding of um, what's called scalar implicature, which would be of the form I just gave. If it's warm, that implicates that it's not hot. Preschool children don't show a sensitivity in the same way as adults do to that sort of phenomenon. Uh, I wonder if these sorts of experiments would work on preschoolers. You know, oddly enough, your father did an experiment on that exact topic. <laughs> and what he finds is something really striking. So if you ask people who are three years old about this kind of case, in order to ask the question, the children have to understand that someone doesn't care about a certain outcome. So he decided to come up with a test of whether someone doesn't understand, doesn't care about something. Do they understand the idea of not caring? So here's the test. Participants were told, this guy is Greg. He does not care about Janian. Does he care about Janian? Three-year-olds three -year consistently failed that test. So when they were asked, does he care about Janian? They would just say yes. Mm -hmm. By the time they got to be four, they mm -hmm. passed that test. So he does not care about Janian. Does he care about Janian? No. As soon as they were able to understand the idea of someone not caring about an outcome, they understood that if someone doesn't care about an outcome and it's bad, then it's seen as intentional. And if they don't care about an outcome and it's good, then it's unintentional. So even four-year-olds are showing the same effect, the same asymmetry between assigning intentional action depending on whether the outcome is positive. Right, negative. exactly. So whatever it is about you that makes you show this effect, mm -hmm. it's got to be Something about you that doesn't differentiate you from a four-year-old, mm -hmm. doesn't differentiate you from a psychopath, doesn't differentiate you from someone with Asperger's, and doesn't, doesn't differentiate you from someone with VMPFC damage. Mm -hmm. So those special qualities that you have, they differ from those people in these other populations. None of those could be playing a role in why you show, show this effect. Professor Nob and his colleagues have accumulated a large body of evidence demonstrating how our ordinary, seemingly factual judgments are shaped by our moral evaluations. In our next segment, The Scientist versus the Moralist, Professor Nob discusses why this is so and defends this tendency of ours against those who would dismiss it as mere bias. Please join us for this next installment of Philosophical Conversations.